All right, let's open our Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Now, before we go into our study, from time to time I give you a COVID update. And so let me give you a COVID update today. It's going to be real short, not real long. But in Hebrews chapter 10, 25, the Bible says, Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much more as you see that day approaching. I, I would love to go into that because it, it is a very, very interesting text, but we're only going to go for a very short thing. The Bible says, not forsaking. And that word not forsaking literally speaks of the fact that if we forsake, we are prone to forget. If we forsake, we are prone to forget. Why do we come to God's house? Why do we come together? Well, you can watch us on YouTube, or you can watch us on Facebook, or you can watch somebody that's far better than me. <laughs> so why? Why come here? Well, there's three basic reasons, and let me go through this very quickly. Number one, for the exercise of the gifts of the Spirit. Every one of you here today, every one of you here this morning, have a gift that God has given you. And you're here for a purpose. That gift is to work for the encouragement of the saints. That work is to provide an atmosphere of worship and blessing. A cadre, a key group of people who have gathered here. Some of you have the gift of encouragement. Some of you have the gift of faithfulness. Some of you have gifts that you say, well, I didn't even know I had. And it encourages us. Oh, beloved, listen, what an encouragement to be in the house of God. So we see, first of all, is to exercise the gifts of the Spirit. You can't do that when you're sitting on a rowboat in the middle of the lake fishing, can you? You can get a lot of things, get sunburned, you can get fish, you can get a lot of things in the middle of the lake, but you can't get fellowship. Secondly, for the encouragement of the saints, you come to strengthen the church for maturity and growth. Oh, listen, that word you shared this morning in Sunday school, that encouragement you gave just because you sat across the, uh, the table from one of your, your beloved brothers or sisters, that encouragement is there to give maturity and growth. And then finally, the third thing for the reason why we gather is because of the enlightenment of the soul. To prevent apostasy in the local body. To minister to the hearts and the heads of those who are attending. You see, there is a problem now. Things are changing. There's a pagan culture versus the Christian word of God. And so what we have to understand, beloved, as we walk daily in the world in which we live, we are inundated, we are bombarded with the philosophies of this world, the culture of this world. And we must be encouraged to live for God and understand his word. So that's why we gather. That's why we come. And as long as we can, you come. As long as we're able, you come. Because, beloved, we need one another. Now, back to Ecclesiastes. That was just a commercial break for a while, okay? <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Boy, I tell you, this is stretching me. This study in Ecclesiastes is certainly stretching me. I hope it's stretching you. I hope it is. I hope you're reading beforehand. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 19. I'm going to read it out of the NIV for you. The Bible says, Wisdom makes one man wise, one wise man more powerful than ten rulers in the city. One wise man more powerful than ten rulers in the city. Obviously, God wants us to be wise. Obviously, God wants us to have wisdom in the matters of our life and daily life as we walk in this world. We need to display the wisdom of God. Be very careful today because there are attributes of people who will throw wisdom out the window and accept the things of this world and become like the things of this world. Folks, we need godly wisdom today more than ever. Beloved, purpose in your heart today, purpose in your life today, that you're going to follow godly wisdom. Turn a little bit to the left of Proverbs chapter 2. 
Proverbs chapter 2. God's wisdom guards our paths and preserves our ways. Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6. The Bible says, for the Lord gives wisdom. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the path of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Oh, beloved, we need godly wisdom today. The Bible teaches us we need to walk in that wisdom. And how do we do that? Where do we find godly wisdom? This is the whole search of Solomon. This whole text that we have today is Solomon searching for godly wisdom. The only problem is he's searching in all the wrong places. He knows better. When he was a young man writing the book of Proverbs, God instilled with him wisdom that was unbelievable. When he wrote the Song of Songs, he spoke of his love for his wife, but also speaking to us a prophetic teaching of God's love for the church. But, oh, beloved, today, as he is getting older, as he's getting closer to his demise, to his death, for some reason, Solomon is forgetting the godly wisdom that he had when he wrote Proverbs. For some reason, as he grew old, he has forgotten the direction of God in his life. We must be very careful, beloved. My pastor used to say it this way. He said it's not as important, much as important as how we begin, but how we end. And oh, beloved, it was uh, Harry Ironside who said this, prayed this every day. Lord, help me not to be a crazy old man. <laughs> oh, beloved, the older we get, the foolisher we get. We must be careful. Solomon here is searching for what he has lost, and that is the wisdom of God. Why? Because he's searching in all the wrong places. We see in verses 20 through 26 the elusiveness of true wisdom. In verse 20 and 22, we see a failed source of godly wisdom. Solomon again is searching. Look at verse 20 through 22. For there is not a just man on the earth who does good and does not sin, and also not take to heart everything people say. Boy, that's good advice. Lest you hear your servant cursing you. For many times also your own heart has known that even you have cursed others. Oh, listen to the words of God's wisdom. We see in verse 20 a warning of fallen sinners. You see, godly wisdom cannot be found in any source but God's word. That's the only place, folks. That's why the devil doesn't want you to read the word of God tomorrow. That's why tomorrow everything is going to turn loose. Every phone call is going to come. Everything, every child, everything has got a problem. Everything's going to happen so that you don't read his word. But beloved, you need to read God's word. Godly wisdom cannot be found in any source but God's word. Psalm 119.105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I learned that years ago in vacation Bible school as a child. Oh, folks, this is very true. That God's word will direct your path. It'll give you strength. It'll give you wisdom. God's word is the true source of wisdom to guide the believer in life. Oh, it's simple, is it not? That's a simple concept. That's something you learned in Sunday school when you were a little child. But, oh, beloved, Solomon had learned that from his father, David. Solomon had learned that from his mother's lap. But he'd forgotten. And that's the tragedy of life, beloved, is when we forget the wisdom of God. Proverbs 2, 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Oh, beloved, it's not in the, in the history books of this world that we find wisdom. It's not in the annals of history or in the, of, of the great documents made and kept in great museums, but rather it's in that simple book that you have in your lap. That book that has been given to us by God through his prophets, through his teachers, through his apostles, 
All of that so that you and I would have God's wisdom. Oh, it's been banned, it's been burned, it's been banished. But it's still here. The truth of God's word, all of sin, we see in verse 20. The Bible says, for there's not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. Oh, isn't that true, isn't it? How come we're so surprised when we hear about people who are in a positions falling into sin? Why are we surprised? Why are we shocked? Beloved, we live in a world like this. We live in a world of sin. The truth of God's word, Romans 3, 9 says, What then? Are you better than they? Not at all, for we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that are all are under sin. There's not a person in this world, not in this room, including me, that are not under the curse of sin. Solomon says, I I'm looking for wisdom, but there's not a just man to give me this wisdom. We see the tragedy of a godless world in verse 20. Who does good and does not sin. In Romans 6, 23, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, beloved, think about this. We live in a world of sin. Where are we going to find the wisdom to live life for God? Where are we going to find the wisdom, the direction, the mile marker, so to speak. The prodigal son thought he had the way. The prodigal son thought he knew the way. His wisdom was far greater than his father's. His wisdom was far greater than his family's. And he sought and took off down the road to find purpose, to find meaning. Oh, we used to have those people all the time when I grew up in the 60s. I'm going to California and finding myself. I went to California. I was found myself before I got there. I was already me before I got to California. And I was me when I got back too. Beloved, let me say this to you. You don't have to go to some far flung place to find yourself. You can find it right there in the word of God and be encouraged and strengthened. We see the fallacy of worldly hearsay in verse 21. Also do not take to heart everything people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Listen, folks, you don't want to hear everything that's spoken about you. You don't. Years ago, I won't tell you which child, but years ago after we went into a little discipline time and the child went into their room, closed the door, I decided, well, I'm going to listen. Wrong move. <laughs> You don't want to do this. I will never forget. I hate him. <laughs> Lord, that killed me. I mean, take a knife and just rip my heart out. And I thought to myself, I will never go to that door again and listen. <laughs> Folks, you don't want to know what everybody thinks about you. First of all, they may all be wrong. Most all of them are, aren't they? <laughs> but the whole bottom line is simple, folks. You don't go to them. You go to God. He knows your heart. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. He knows you from top to bottom. And guess what? He still loves you. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Listen, he loved you when you didn't get it right. He loved you when you didn't have it all together. And he said, I'm going to die for you. He didn't wait till we got it so we got good. But he loved us. What does that do? That frees me up, folks. I don't have that performance trap anymore. I don't have to do anything to make God love me more. You see, there's nothing I can do to make God love me more. There's not enough Bible that I can read, and you should read your Bible. There's not enough church services I can go to to make him love me more, but you ought to go to church services. But you see, the opposite is true. There's nothing I can do to make him love me less. You see, he loved me while I was a sinner. He loved me while I was yet a sinner. Why should I go to other people who don't know me like God knows me? Why should I care what other people think who don't know me? God knows me, loves me, cares for me, gives me eternal life. Oh, beloved, think about it. 
We see the fallacy of worldly hearsay. Proverbs 25, 11, a, world, a word fitly or aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Oh, it's precious. It's precious treasure in the life when someone is encouraging. Oh, listen, beloved, life is great until you meet that one who's been given the gift of discouragement. I'm telling you, Solomon is saying, give me someone who can encourage me. Give me someone who can say, Solomon, you can do better. You can do right. We see here the fallacy of worldly hearsay. Go to God. He'll tell you the truth. He'll give you strength. It's because he loves you. You know he loves you. In verse 22, we see the folly of wicked hearts. The Bible says, for many times also your own heart has known that even you have cursed others. Oh, you've said it under your breath. You've said it in your thoughts. You may have not spoke out. You may have not said it. But oh, beloved, in your heart of hearts, you did. Solomon says, I'm no better than they are. Oh, beloved, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, have we not? James 3.10 says, out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. You see, the wisdom comes from God's heart, comes from his word. And oh, beloved, it doesn't come from my heart. It doesn't come from your heart. It comes from God's heart. In verses 23 through 26, we see a failed search for godly wisdom. Looking for God's wisdom in all the wrong places. God's wisdom is in his word, beloved. Solomon missed out. He searched everywhere. He searched all the places, all the places of entertainment. He searched all the places of amusement. He served all the places where they had great food and great things. But guess what, beloved? It wasn't there. Psalm 119.11 says, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Again, a scripture text I hope you learned when you were a child. God's word in our heart gives us wisdom. We see the folly of his search in verse 23 and 24. Look at his ineffective attempt in verse 23. The Bible says, all this I have proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. He said, I, I, I'm going to be wise. I'm going to prove myself to be wise. I'm going to learn everything I can and then I'll be wise. Oh, beloved, I don't care how many degrees you have behind your name. And many of us have, you know, these things. But listen to me. Wisdom does not come from learning. It comes from God's word. It comes from God. We see here in the folly of his search, by going to the world, Solomon has failed in his attempt to find true wisdom. You see, today it's very simple. In today's world, it's the culture, the wisdom of the culture that determines what we ought to believe. You see, it used to be God's word would be an important place where we can find the wisdom of the world. You know, I remember in school, Bible reading. I remember in public school, the Lord's Prayer. I remember all these things and children coming to hear the word of God. My pastor used to tell me that he was, remember his dad, his dad was a preacher, came come to school every Friday. They would have a preacher come in and do a, a Bible study at school. But you see, we said we're too smart for that. Let's take God's wisdom out. Let's go ahead and just put the world's wisdom in. And look where it's taken us. You see, God's world versus the culture. Culture does not, does not give us God's word. Culture today does not interpret God's word for us. Culture does not interpret our lives. Folks, God's word interprets our lives. And so we see, beloved, an ineffective attempt. Romans 1.22 says, professing to be wise, they became fools. Solomon should have remembered who true, truly authored the wisdom of Proverbs. Solomon should have remembered those times when God spoke to his heart as he was writing out that writ of the Holy Bible in the book of Proverbs. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally 
and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Oh, beloved, every time you open the Bible, you pray, ask God, give me wisdom. Every time you read the word of God, ask God, speak to my heart with this matter. Give me wisdom and what I need. And I promise you, you will not be disappointed. God's word is so important for our life. We see his inadequate achievement in verse 24. The Bible says, as for that which is far off and exceedingly deep, who can find it out? Who can know the trueness of the wisdom of God? Who can understand? You see, worldly wisdom has its limitations. Truly, God, truly God's wisdom was far beyond Solomon's grasp at this point of his life. Solomon was looking for wisdom in all the wrong places, and therefore God's wisdom was beyond his grasp. Solomon was searching again in all the wrong places. In Proverbs, again, chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2, starting with verse 3. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Where do you get that, folks? You get it from the word. That's one of the greatest books we have in this world. That Bible that you have is the greatest wisdom of all mankind. And many people, their search is folly for wisdom. Verse 25 and 26, we see the failure of its search. Solomon resolves to find enlightenment in verse 25. I applied my heart to know, to search and seek out wisdom, and the reasons of things to know the wickedness of folly, even of the foolishness and madness. Solomon, in his quest for wisdom, sought to understand the foolishness of insanity and the folly of wickedness. Kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? But you see, this is vanity. Even Solomon said that. This search is vanity. It is like grasping for the wind. Ecclesiastes, the first chapter. Many weeks ago, we studied this, this, these verses. In verse 16, chapter 1, verse 16, I, I commune with my heart saying, Look, I have attained greatness, and I've gained more wisdom than all who are before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge, and I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is grasping for the wind. Years ago, I met a man in my undergraduate work and who had been a, a going to a Christian college. And there he announced to everybody in the classroom, he said, I'm giving up on God. I'm going to spend the rest of my life proving that God does not exist. Here was a young man who had gone through classes in, in, in Bible school and, and everything, and he was telling the people there, I'm no longer going after, I'm going to prove God doesn't exist. And I asked him, I said, this is foolishness. Why don't you spend the rest of your life trying to prove that God does exist? Maybe at the end of your search, you'll find out it's true. Maybe at the end of your search, you won't be foolish. But if you do the other route, guess what? If God is real, you've lost everything. But he's foolish. Foolish wisdom. Foolish wisdom. Solomon recognizes his entrapment in verse 26. He uses a very unique, unique way of describing the entrapment of sin. Look at verse 26. The Bible says... And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart it sna is snares and nets, whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be trapped by her. Oh, my. Solomon must have hated women, right? He was a woman hater. Look at that. Isn't that terrible? I'm telling you. Solomon wasn't. Going after every woman on the face of the earth. What Solomon was saying was very simple. Solomon likens the search for worldly pagan wisdom as spiritual adultery and idol worship. The woman who was a snare. 
This was the whole aspect of finding wisdom outside of God's wisdom. It's a trap. It takes you down a road further than you want to go. It leaves you empty more than you want to give. And oh, beloved, by the time you're done with that worldly wisdom search, guess what? You wake up and you say, I've wasted my life. That's what Solomon is saying. He said, I've given in to the religion of my wives. Oh, they've taken me to the, to the temples of evil. And I've worshipped with them. Folks, listen, Solomon went so far as to worship with his false religion wives. And he says, it's, it's a trap. Be careful how far you go, because it is a trap. We see now in, in verses 27 through 29, the estrangement of true wisdom in Solomon's life. In verse 27 and 28, we see mankind's needful requirement. What's the requirement? We see the search of the preacher. He goes back now to being the preacher. In verse 27, here is what I have found, says the preacher, adding one thing to the other to find out the reason. He said, I've put this and this together, and I've followed this path, and this is what I've found. We see the result of his search and the revelation of his search. We see in Proverbs 8, 7, it says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. Oh, do you seek God diligently? Oh, do you, do you every day spend time seeking for that relationship of God? You see, therein lies the issue, does it not? In the morning you wake up, First thing you ought to say is, God, thank you for this day. What a way to start the day out in wisdom, huh? Realizing that this is the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. It affects your day in a way. No matter what comes your way, God is still in control, is he not? Solomon was putting the puzzle together and he gets the picture. Now, I'm not a puzzle person. Deborah is. She can do a puzzle. Man, I'm telling you, during this time we had all that isolation, she could do a puzzle, trust me. Now me, pair of scissors, puzzle has no problem for me whatsoever. Got that one fits perfect, look at that. It doesn't look like anything, but it, it fits. But Solomon was putting the pieces together. Like Hansel and Gretel finding their little crumbs and, and leaving their crumbs to find their way back. Solomon was desperately trying to find his way back and the pieces were not fitting together. We see his revelation in his search in verse 27, adding one thing to another, finding out the reason. We see his revelation. Proverbs 8th chapter again tells us, 8, 17, I love those who love me. And those who seek me diligently will find me. Solomon was desperately seeking. Look at verse 28, the scrutiny of the probe. Which my soul still seeks, but I cannot find. One man among a thousand I have found, but a woman among all these I have not found. Ooh, there it goes again. <laughs> that woman hater Solomon. But that's not what he's saying. Be careful how you, you look at the word of God. I start out, when I read the word of God, I always start out this way. This is God's word. It is correct. It is true. It is without error. I'm the one who don't get it. Okay? That's how I start out reading the Bible. And let me say this, folks. These are one of those times when we may not get it. But what we see in verse 28 is the sinless, upright man. In verse 28, the Bible says, which my soul still seeks, but I cannot find. One man among a thousand I have found. One man. Only one man. The rest of men and all the women, no, they're not this. Only one man have I found. Who was that man? Wasn't Solomon. Solomon's already said, I don't have it. Turn in your Bibles a little bit to the left, to the book of Job, on the other side of, of Psalms. Book of Job. Job gives us some information on this. Job 33, verse 23. 
Job 33, verse 23. If there is a messenger for him, a mediator, one among a thousand, there's that one, isn't it? To show man his uprightness. Oh, his uprightness, that's H is capitalized, meaning God's uprightness. Then he is gracious to him and says, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. Oh, I have found a redeemer. His flesh shall be like young like a child. He's going to grow up like a child. He shall return to the days of his youth. He'll be a young man. He shall pray to God and he'll delight in him. He shall see his face with joy for he restores to man his righteousness. Oh, he's speaking of Jesus. When Solomon says, I only know one person that's going to be the Messiah. Only one about all of them is going to be righteous, and that's one. No man, no woman is going to be perfect. No man, no woman are going to be righteous. We see the sinful unrighteousness of mankind in verse 28. I found none. Oh, Solomon searched diligently. Person to person, family member to family member, friend to friend, acquaintance to acquaintance, stranger from stranger. He, he had all the people of the world coming to him and he said, I've not found one, not one, who's righteous. But there is one who's coming. Romans 3.10 says, as it is right in there, it, that is as written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Oh, Solomon knew that. He saw it. They're none righteous. Look at verse 29. Truly, this only I have found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. We see mankind's needful redemption in verse 29. Mankind's significant creation was simple. God made man upright. He made Adam and Eve in perfection. Adam was made in God's image. He was made without sin and without defect. This is not, our world is not how God meant for it to be. Your life was not meant to be the way God designed it for. You and I were to live in perfection, in holy perfection, with a relationship with God and live forever in that relationship. One day we're going to have that. Adam was created in perfection, Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Now, God created both Adam and Eve in his image. If that is true, how can you have two different type of people, completely different, in the same image? Is God a woman or is God a man? You got two things here. God is the Father. I understand that's male, is it not? But we see here that he made them both in his image. What is he speaking about? He's speaking of very interesting thing. Though there were two distinctly different beings, he made them in the image of the triune being of the Godhead. He created Adam and Eve with a body, with a soul, and with a spirit. In the image of God, so that when God came into the garden, he could speak with Adam and Eve. He could deal with Adam and Eve. He could have a relationship with Adam and Eve. But when sin came in, you remember the story, Adam was hiding. God came in. He said, I heard you coming. I heard your voice. I heard you coming. And I hid myself. First time we hear this word. First time in the Bible. And what did God say? Why did you hide yourself? Because I was afraid. I was naked. And God said to him, who told you you were naked? Have you ate the fruit I told you not to eat? God knew. Waiting for the confession. First John 1, 9, if you'll confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But how did Adam react? It's that woman you gave me. She gave it to me and I ate it. Woman? It's that serpent you made. That serpent gave it to me. Oh, beloved, think about that. That's sin. Sin pointing the different direction, pointing the different way. Folks, we are sinners born into sin. I'm born like my father and my mother. They gave it to me. Not only did I get all their DNA, but I got all their sin too. So did you. Created with purpose. 
created in perfection. Adam and Eve were created as perfect beings in a perfect world to live and work in God's perfect creation as its caretakers. But sin changed all that. Sin changed all that. Every weed, every thorn, every problem, every thing we go through in life is because of sin. Solomon is seeing this in verse 29, that God made man upright, but they've sought out many schemes. They, they've tried to get around all the stuff of God. Man's sinful cunning, in verse 29, the Bible says, but they have sought out many schemes, the fall of mankind. Romans seven twelve says, therefore, just as one man, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because of all sin. Solomon is thinking there's wisdom here. I'm getting ready to die. I'm getting old. He's in his late 70s. His father lived to be 70 when he died. Solomon's thinking I'm almost 80. You know, I'm going to be coming around the corner any time now. And death is coming. How in the world can I get around this? Do you realize there are people today all over the world seeking to stop this thing called death? To, to perhaps, I've, have you been reading about people who are talking about the AI phenomenon where you can download who you are into a computer? <laughs> and you get to be a robot for the rest of your life. That's eternal life for the world. Oh, I'm telling you, folks. You get to be one of those danger, danger, Will Robinson. <laughs> Not me, folks. Be absent from the body is present with the Lord. I'm going home. How about you? But I'm telling you, folks, this world will seek out everything. Solomon was thinking, I'm getting ready to die here. We all got that in the back of our mind, don't we? We all got that in the back of our brain, don't we? We wake up one morning, we say, thank you, Lord, for this day. We go to bed, and I say, Lord, give me another day. And if not, I'll be with you. We see the fallibility of men. In Psalm chapter 14, Psalm chapter 14, starting with verse 1, the Bible says very, very importantly, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. Do they have wisdom? Verse 3, they all have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. The psalmist David here says, Solomon, you're a sinner. Solomon, you're going to die as I died. That's the wisdom of the world. But what's the wisdom of God? Oh, as Paul said it this way, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Oh, beloved, that's the hope we have in Jesus. That's the hope we have. Paul says to the church of Thessalonica, do not, do not grieve as those who have no hope. Oh, beloved, we have hope. That's the wisdom of God. God. Man's wisdom tells us there's a problem. There's sin and death. Death's coming. There's a problem. God's wisdom tells us there's a problem. There's sin and there's death. There's a problem. But only God's word, his wisdom, gives us the true solution. That solution is the atoning sacrifice of God's Son. Jesus has his gift of salvation, eternal life. Romans 6.23 out of the Amplified Bible has a unique way of saying it. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God that is his remarkable, overwhelming gift of grace to believers is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's wisdom. That's the wisdom we need today, beloved. That's the wisdom not, you know, I don't mean to be ugly, but they can go to the moon, they can go to Mars, they can do all what they want. And isn't that fascinating? But oh, beloved, you can have all of that and still miss eternal life. Oh, seek for the wisdom of God today. 
Seek to share the wisdom of God with others. Folks, it is life that God has given us, eternal life. Let us pray. Our Father God, we thank you for your word. But more especially at this time, Father, we thank you for the strength and the encouragement and the peace that it brings to our hearts. Well, Father God, as we go through life, walking down the paths of life, give us wisdom, Father, to search your word, to seek that light which you have given us, that we might light our path, to walk that way, to find hope, to find strength, to find encouragement. Oh, Lord, keep our hearts mindful of your wisdom. Keep our hearts mindful, Father, of your love and your grace through Jesus. And, oh, Father God, if there be someone today does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, watching on Facebook or, or even on, on YouTube, Father God, help them to understand that that drawing of the Holy Spirit is real and he's drawing them right now to Jesus. Let them understand, Father, that we're all born sinners. Help them to understand we're all in that same boat and the boat is sinking. And a few of us have life preservers, Father. Oh, let them seek that life preserver of Jesus. Let them understand that Jesus loves them. He died for them as the Son of God. He came to die for their sins. And he rose from the dead to give them life everlasting. Help them to understand and to receive that gift of salvation. Help them to pray something like this in their heart and mean it with all their life. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I confess my sins. And I ask God's forgiveness of my sins. I repent of them. And I thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins and rising, raising from the dead to give me life everlasting. And now I open the door of my heart to you today, Jesus. Come into my life and, and save my soul. And Jesus, to the best of my ability, I will follow you and live the rest of my life for you. Thank you, Jesus. As we continue in prayer, Father, those who prayed that prayer on Facebook or on, on YouTube, let them, Father, make that decision public. Help them to tell a family member or a friend or even come into a church service and make that public through baptism. Whatever decision, Father God, give them the heart and the strength to do so. Be with us today, Father, in this time of decision that hearts would be changed and lives would be redirected and, and men and women would follow the wisdom of God. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Blessed be the time.